I hope you had a good lunch. <laughs> yes. So uh, actually, you know, this youth uh, concurrent session, this part is a workshop. So we have a uh, two distinguished uh, trainer and also a youth leader by their own right uh, to give you certain points about uh, uh, leadership. So uh, I think, uh, Nicholas, you can introduce uh, Michael. I <laughs> <laughs> um, just want to start because timing. Uh, I just want to have a quick introduction about Michael. We have a Malaysian youth icon here in, you know, in this room. Uh, the title today is Sustainable Volunteerism, right? Transforming Youth Culture. And everyone, have you ever volunteered any kind of works, volunteering? Yeah. You did any volunteering works? Yeah. Uh, almost everyone, right? So you feel good when you do volunteering and you're helping people and reach out to people and you can learn a lot, right, throughout the process. But uh, now, how can we uh, offer our best, offer our time at the same time? It's how to sustain, you know, that what you are contribute, you know. That's how we form the team. And Michael here today, he's going to touch upon these uh, topics, you know, how to create a sustainable volunteerism. Right, let's uh, put a hand to Mr. Michael Tio, you know, to Thank you so much, Nicholas. Uh, a very, I would say, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here. I would like to run this session like a masterclass, so I hope uh, you wouldn't mind me walking around and perhaps even inviting to interact with you. How is that? Is that okay? Fantastic. Okay. So uh, just to give you a little bit background of where I'm coming from, uh, last night I had the great opportunity to speak at the Global Youth Fest. Talked a little bit about my journey around the world last night, uh, way back in the year 2011, when I had the opportunity for that one year to embark on an expedition to 22 countries. And I've worked with governments, businesses, and NGOs on social innovation and social change projects pretty much working as a volunteer capacity, as a planner capacity. Uh, came back to Malaysia, I'm an entrepreneur right now. I have businesses in the fields of education, uh, digital publishing, and event management. Uh, most of you would have heard of this brand called TED Talks. And for my company, we hold the largest license in Malaysia, as we've been doing the TEDx Talks here for Kuala Lumpur for the past four years, heading strong into the fifth year for next year. At the same time, today we are talking about sustaining volunteerism, transforming youth culture. Who am I to share with you about this topic? Let's give a perspective. Number one, I started off as a grassroots youth leader. What's a grassroots youth leader? Someone who had this idea, who's crazy enough at the middle of the night, just woke up and said, let's set up a Facebook group and let's gather all my friends in university, let's gather all my friends in my community and let's volunteer next week for a program. Let's develop an event in a month's time. I came from that school. Using Facebook, going to university, getting my peers excited about volunteering for a good cause. Now, if you remember that one extreme, are we clear so far? Now, moving on to my right-hand side, the other extreme. Last year, I was offered a golden opportunity to relearn and to redevelop myself. What do I mean by that? Last year, it was the first time at the age of 25 I was invited to sit as a board of trustee for the National Student Volunteers Foundation under the Ministry of Education, where our patron is the Honorable Deputy Prime Minister. Earlier this year, I've had the great privilege to work with Nicholas, uh, Tansri Zaleha, and their amazing team for the Global Peace Festival Malaysia, because I'm also a board of director with the Global Peace Federation Malaysia right here. So we're all the same, we're all sharing the same interests. And at the same time, recently, I was also made the special advisor to the Minister of Youth and Sports uh, as a specially appointed member by the Minister to advise the Minister of Youth and Sports of Malaysia about youth development matters. So I've gone from grassroots movement, getting youths involved through Facebook groups, going to university, shouting out top of my lung to get people excited to volunteer, to policy, where pretty much I'm involved with crafting out policies that would motivate that would sustain the motivation for youths to volunteer. Are we clear so far? 
So I hope with this little validation, you would give me your time for me to share what I have in mind. Okay? First, this is quite historic. I rarely use a whiteboard. This is going to be one of my first few times. But I need to demonstrate something to you. So we're talking about sustaining volunteerism. Now, we understand that people would come and talk to you saying that, you know, you should sustain your spirit to volunteer because it's something good to do. Now, the other speakers, good colleagues of mine, great speakers, great experts in their own fields, they're going to tell you that later, how leadership is important, how just giving back is important. I'm going to touch the dry stuff. I'm going to touch about stuff that is in the system. So first, I believe to sustain volunteerism in anything that you do, in any organization, you need to have three components. Number one would be the intent. The intent of your project, the intent of your organization, the intent of your movement. The second element would be talents. Who are you going to get to be part of your team? What roles are they going to play? And last but not least, resources. Now, what are all these? Let's start with intent. I believe in my years of volunteering, in my years of working with government, businesses, and NGOs to move young people to give their time for the benefit of society, it always comes back to the intent, your intent of setting up the organization, your intent of setting up that project, your intent of setting up that campaign. Now, you may have your own intentions. You want to set up a campaign to promote anti... Uh, crime or you want to set up a campaign to promote more green business that's fine that's your intent you have a bigger cause to promote however you have to now consider two points right here is what i call your individual goal and the other one would be your collective goal now what do we mean now let's talk about individual goals first when you talk about individual goal you have to ask yourself why are you doing that project why are you investing so much time in your organization to launch that project why is it so significant to you and i'll tell you why it's important for you as human beings our motivations run out especially when you talk about volunteerism when you're not getting paid so what happens is if you're not getting compensated in any form your intent your discipline your principle has to be strong so you need to ask yourself what is it in it for you research by renowned universities and psychologists around the world shows you can be the most pure and most noble human being around the world but in the end each one of us have an intent deep in our heart so think about it what is your intent you need to be clear with that and admit it it's fine that you're doing a volunteer work and you have, you want to achieve something. Some of your intent would be, I want to bring a good name to my country. I want to showcase what I can do through leadership and volunteerism, which is fine. Write those goals down, be clear. Are we clear so far? Secondly, let's talk about collective goals. Now, this is very important. Collective goals will influence the talent that you get. Now, when you start your project, you have to now think, what is your intent to get people excited and join you in your project, in your volunteer movement? What makes it exciting? Why should they even join you? I understand that some of you would think, I'll never know. Why would Harry, John, Susan join my project? But try to think, what would they want? What would you want them to become? Hopefully, I'm sure it's a good impact at the end of the day. But ask yourself, when you launch a movement, what do you want the people who will be joining you, how would you want them to grow with you? Very important. Are we clear so far? All right. Now, we're going to move on to the second part, that is talent. Now, for talent, we have two branches as well. You need talent, from my experience, so far, working in over 30 countries already, you must have leadership and you must have what I call implementers what does this mean now to sustain the very spirit to volunteer you need to understand the intent of the people whom you recruit am I right now what's important when you recruit them you need to now help them identify where they want to go next what phase of growth that they want to grow into 
And this would relate to either a leadership role or an implementation role. Now, running TEDx talks here in Malaysia, as you know, is a non-for-profit. We work with a lot of young people. And a lot of companies these days, they tend to engage us. Multinational companies tend to engage my group, my partners, and my businesses to help them understand how to work with a very volatile group. That is the Generation Y, right? The millennials, as some of you would call it. Because they said this group is so volatile, they always change their mind, their passion is not steady. It's not <coughs> sealed in stone. How do you work with them? The average age of talents, employees that my companies have worked with are all aged in an average of 25 years old. The old my, my partner is the only guy who pushed up that limit to, because he's 32. But we work with a lot of Gen Y. But how did we work with them? The same with volunteerism. Before you get them involved with your project, if you want to sustain their interest for them to work with you, you need to communicate with them. You need to interact with them. How? Ask them questions. What do you want to do today? Why are you joining this project? Let them be honest with you. Some of them, they are going to tell you, I'm here to make more money. That's fine. Manage their expectations. If you're not going to compensate them, that's fine. But do tell them this. The skills that you will learn from this volunteering project can indeed help elevate your potential to potentially earn more income. I'm being very, very practical and straightforward here. As far as we have worked with young people, a huge group of them do come to us and say, I want to make more money. I want to make more wealth. I want to give a better life to my family. And we said, volunteer with us develop your skills, learn from mistakes with us, harness your potential, and then go off and be an economical powerhouse in the future. So this is what we tell them. But as we ask them more questions, we tend to understand, would they want to be implementers? Where they're implementing a project with you, they are your operations person, they are your, lo your logistics person, they are your runners in your events, or, are they more equipped towards leadership? Now, from our personal experience, having worked with over 300 young people as talent, as our employees, as our staff, in the collective projects they have done for our company, those who usually say, I'm not in it for the money, I want the experience, I want to empower more lives, you would most likely find that their motivation to sustain their volunteering effort would stem by giving them a leadership position. They want to inspire. They want to talk to their friends about what they have done. They want to prove that they have what it takes to succeed. While those of them who talked about, I want to be compensated, I want to be paid by the hour, most of them are most likely implementers. So you need to be clear. And if they're implementers, you need to talk to them to manage expectations. A lot of volunteers drop out of projects because their expectations are not managed. They go into a project thinking that they're going to get to know the presidents and the prime ministers. But on your event day, if the president couldn't come, you would have made them very disappointed. They drop off. So manage expectations. Be clear. Ask them what do they want to achieve through their involvement with your organization, with your project, with your volunteering efforts. Are we clear so far? Fantastic. Now we'll move on to the last chapter, that is resources. For resources, there are actually three elements here. Number one, to sustain any volunteering efforts, let's be clear, we have to have what? Can anyone take a guess? What do we need to have to sustain volunteering efforts? Resources. What's that? Money? Fantastic. Money, or what I would say in a more sexy word, funding. All right. What else? Come on, don't be shy. Take a guess. If you have an opportunity to go out and ask for anything you want to support your volunteering campaign, what would you want? Sponsorship? Okay, sponsorship's funding. That's great. What else? What's that? Oh, sorry. Oh, you just came in. Fantastic. <laughs> right. People, fantastic. People would be talent right there, but great. Yes, people. What else? Logistics, great, yes. Opportunity, all right, what else? Competence, all right, okay. Competence, knowledge. I would round this all up into something I call mentoring 
or guided leadership. You know, a lot of NGOs, a lot of projects fail because they don't get the right advice. They don't get the right people in their team. And most of the time, they just need to ask organizations to help them. And I'll share with you. Now, I have one more here in my list. That is, I'm not sure if it's important in your countries, but in Malaysia, it's very important. It's called endorsements. Now, quickly, let's just go through this tree. Funding-wise, let us be absolutely honest with each other. We can have an idea, we can launch a project, but at the end of the day, if there's no funding, we may have 100 volunteers, but if no one is going to pay the food caterer, our volunteers are going to go hungry. Right? You know, I was in Colombia and we built houses for the hardcore poor in the year 2011. What was important was I gave a speech to 800 people. They were inspired. They decided to accept my challenge to build houses. Dedicated four days to do that. Now the problem was, how are we going to find the planks? How are we going to find the instruments, the tools for us to build those houses? Thank God we had sponsors during that time. But imagine if you were in that position. You have 800 strong men and women who are willing to help. But at the end of the day, you do not have the resources. So think about it. Funding is important. That is to help you to sustain the volunteering movement. And funding comes from my experience with you starting to ask people, starting to talk to certain ministries, starting to talk to certain companies, philanthropists, and getting them to buy in your idea. Most of the time you may be thinking that it's just a volunteering project, it's no big deal. A lot of successful people today, the more successful they become, the more they want to give back. And unfortunately, for these very successful people, they do not have the time to build houses for you. They do not have the time to promote anti-crime campaigns with you. What they do have is money. Are we clear so far? So start asking. Two more points. Mentoring, or what I call guided leadership. Very important. Some organizations that I've dealt with before with my training companies, like a mentor of mine, before I started my training company, he said, I'm going to invest in your company, but I'm not going to invest money. I'm going to invest my experience. I'm going to mentor you. And that makes a huge difference. I started off as a micro company, a tiny company. Today, my company service clients like Microsoft, Intel, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, where we do training for young people's development in communication, leadership, and globalizing their minds to be more competitive in the marketplace. But it all started because my mentor, who runs a world-class consulting firm, mentored me and said, don't go for the small fish. When you want to hit the first big net, when you want to cast your net, go for the big fishes. Get them to know what you can do for them, and then the rest will follow. So mentoring is very important. That was an example. Go to organizations, admit that you do not have the expertise to do the project. Invite them into a collaboration where you can learn from them. Invite them into a partnership where they can give their expertise and their knowledge to you. And remember, when you engage people like that, your organization, your staff, your own leadership, yourself will be better than your organization, yourself and your staff yesterday. Because you have gotten more knowledge and more experience and more expertise from people. The last point we have there would be endorsements. This has become quite important, especially in Asian countries, where I'm not sure how many of you here have heard of this model called the Hofstede model of cultural difference. Have you heard of that? You may want to Google it, right? All right, now that's a study about cultural differences, about doing business, about doing projects in Malaysia. World-renowned professor Hofstede's model of cultural difference. Now, based on Hofstede's model, in most Asian countries, and I believe also in Africa, if I'm not wrong. He described as countries with a high power distance. What is power distance? Power distance means if you are a senator, if you are a minister in Malaysia, in China, in Singapore, in Indonesia, you are quite revered. You are respected. People look up to you. You know, yesterday we have the Honorable Minister from the Prime Minister's Department he has a Tan Sri in front of him, a salutation title that was given to him as a form of respect. Now, in most cultures, when you have high power distance, it also means that people are indoctrined into that culture, where people who have 
earn titles, people who are ministers, people who are CEOs of big companies, when they promote a message, most likely the masses will buy it. Most likely when you want a closer sponsorship, they will say yes to you because you have that person backing you. You have that person saying good words about your project. Now, I'll just share one last example before I conclude and then I'll pass it on to my other colleagues with endorsements. I studied in New Zealand for two years. It was during that time when I studied in New Zealand, I was involved very actively in volunteerism through this student-run business organization called SAIF, Students in Free Enterprise, or today they have rebranded themselves as Enactus. I was involved in that project and we were running 10 projects for the people of New Zealand. One day, I walked in with a crazy idea and I told my teammates, guys, how about writing a letter to the Prime Minister of New Zealand during that time, the Honorary Helen Clark? And I got greeted with laughters instead. They laughed at me because they said, you know, she is the Prime Minister. Your project is nothing. It's small within the radar for anyone to consider you seriously. Your project is a university project. It's not even a regional project. It's not even a state project. It's not even a nationwide project. It's just a university project. Why would you have the insane mind to write that letter to think that she's going to revert back to you? I went around second time and I asked my teammates, I'm going to write this letter. I need your names. And they said, no, we're not going to be embarrassed just like you. So they were afraid of failure, which is fine. I wrote the letter, in two weeks time, the mail arrived into my, uh, to my house in New Zealand, to my relative's house, I was staying with relatives. And my auntie went to fetch that letter and she read the headline from Prime Minister's office. First thing, she ran into the house, nearly rammed down my room door and said, what did you do, what did you do? Why did you get a letter from the Prime Minister? And then when I opened that letter, it was signed by Helen Clark and she endorsed the good work that my projects were doing even though we have impacted only a thousand people, but still it were lives impacted. And then only then I started to realize what was even funnier was that two weeks from then, I had three more letters sent by three cabinet ministers. And they sent the letter saying that, oh, we heard from our prime minister that you're doing an amazing job. And we decided to write a testimonial for you as well. And my university was blown away. I mean, my university was surprised. They were like, You've gotten a testimonial from the Prime Minister of New Zealand, provided the fact that you're not even a New Zealand-born student to begin with. You are Malaysian, you are a foreign student studying right there. What was your secret? And I said, my secret was I just took up the pen, wrote about the impact that my projects were doing, and I sent it off to the Prime Minister. Do you know her relatives? How did you send the letter to her? No, I just sent it to her office, that's it. I followed up with an email. So think about it. And using that endorsement, that letter, we went on and compete in global competitions. And it was through that letter that I've gained so much credibility that I've represented New Zealand throughout my university time as a foreign Malaysian student seven times to global competitions. It all starts with an endorsement letter. It all starts with someone believing in what you do. So think about it. To get resources, funding is important. Mentoring or guided leadership is important. But endorsement, don't overlook it. I'm sure your statesmen, your members of parliament, your ministers, the CEOs, your mentors of your companies would want to hear the good work that you're doing. And to conclude, last but not least, when you're doing a good work, you want to sustain volunteerism, you want to sustain that very spirit of giving back, you need to start asking yourself, what is it in it for me to grow as an individual what is it in it for the people that I'm going to recruit? How can they grow? And what's in it for the stakeholders? People who will provide me with resources that will enable me to do a bigger impact to my people. Thank you so much for your time again. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your presentations. As you see, he's still very young, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, the how he gets where he is now is because you know he has desire and passion, right, with what he does. 
and also desire to really now to share his experience that all these young people here in this room, I think share <laughs> same, right? That you want to do something good with society <coughs> and on the way you want to achieve something, right? So I think, you know, he's really uh, one of the example <laughs> and uh, very fortunate to have him here and I want to thank him again. Thank you, thank yeah. you. <coughs> uh, also, I want to introduce next speaker, uh, Konstantin Papkov. Pap <laughs> he's a Russian, and actually he's a CEO, and uh, he's running a uh, leadership center in this region of Ural. I don't know if you heard about it. Uh, Ural is about, you know, the entrance to Siberia and Europe in between. I think now it's around minus 20. <laughs> <laughs> so he came all the way to share his experience. Uh, his program received one of the top three awards in Russia as a leadership program. And himself is running uh, you know, this leadership center and very successful in that sense. He also has a business running I don't know if he's a wealthy businessman, but anyway, he's somewhere there. So please, uh, yeah. Uh, people at this conference asked me, what is the guy from Russia doing at the peace conference? <laughs> <laughs> and I was reminded of all kinds of uh, decades-long or centuries-long conflicts that Russia was involved in. So I guess uh, there will be no global peace without Russia, that's why. <laughs> <coughs> so actually, uh, I am running a leadership uh, center in Russia, and uh, it's true that we uh, won the third prize. We gave in to uh, Gazprom, which is the largest gas and oil manufacturer in Russia, and Europe knows well what Gazprom is. And uh, the, the first one was United Russia Party, which is the president's party, so you can understand. <coughs> but in fact, although I do have a business, I consider myself to be a volunteer. And when I was a student, that's uh, when we started to be volunteers. And uh, until today, uh, I continue this volunteer work. So uh, I. I have the business, but I have a, a lot of non-profit organizations and activities too. So I believe that sustainable volunteerism is actually a school of true leadership. Our leadership, I think, is the main topic that we discuss here because we are expected to become leaders who are going to change the world. So what do I mean by uh, saying true leadership? Well, in business or in politics, you can be a leader because you have a position, right? Because you can cut the salary, you can fire people, and people out of respect or maybe fear kind of respect you. But honestly speaking, they must be afraid of you. But you may feel like you're a great leader and doing a great job. <laughs> but as long as they have an opportunity to revenge, have a better job opportunity, so you will find out what kind of leader you are in reality. So, but in volunteerism, you are not paying anything, right? And there are four reasons, so please remember these four points why people will be with you in nonprofit work. First, <coughs> you stand for something people really believe in. Your mission, your cause, your dream, your vision is something that people want to be part of. So this is number one. So in volunteerism, it's, it's not self-promotion, right? So you have to advocate a noble cause that inspires people. The second, uh, people look at you and uh, so they want to find out whether you are a person who can be trusted, right? If your words and your deeds are not aligned with what you believe, people are not going to trust you. And they will not want to be involved in your work. Number three, people like to be in the group that you are leading. So they like to be 
a part of exciting team. Let's say you have a lot of creative ideas, you have a lot of team synergy, and as a team, people actually like it to be with you as a leader. And number four is actually outcomes, results, mind-blowing outcomes. Because if the work is boring or primitive or ordinary, well, young people, especially Generation Y, will say, so what, right? There are much more exciting things to do in life. So these four things, your cause or your mission, your vision, second, you as a person, your character, third, your team, and the fourth, the outcomes that actually show what kind of dream you really have. And actually, leadership is a relational concept. So actually, we don't call ourselves leaders, right? Because relational concept, like a father is someone who has who? Children, right? Children are small human beings who, at some point of their life, have parents. Husband is someone who has a wife, and the wife is someone who has a husband. So who is a leader? Sometimes young people say that they are leaders because they are active, they are stubborn, they are bright, or uh, maybe they are arrogant, or they don't know how to, uh, uh, how to stay in a group. They have a lot of infighting and conflicts, and some say, oh, they're all leaders there, so there's no agreement among them. <laughs> so they are not leaders, they are just being young. <laughs> so, <coughs> and in this sense, without people on board, without people on your team, you're not actually a leader yet. So that's why I wanted to focus in this presentation how volunteerism actually is all about inspiring greatness in people. How do you bring about the best in people and how you build up your team? Because actually without the team, a leader, as we have a joke in Russia, is always pregnant with great ideas. But they never materialize. They never actually <laughs> come into reality. And that's why, the, in other words, the power of the leader comes from his team. No matter how brilliant he is, no matter how talented he is, if he is alone, what can, can he do? He can tweet a lot. <laughs> and he get a lot of likes, right? That's great, but when it comes to moving a nation or the world, you do have, you, you do have to have a, a team with you. So in Christianity, there is a concept that Christians are the body of Christ, right? What does it mean? That actually they're like the hands and the legs and the feet and the mouth and the eyes of Christ. So you could say that the team is the body of a leader. So without the team, the leader is just a talking head, right? So the strength of the leader comes from the skills and talents that are in his team. And actually, I wanted to say that leadership is not just a social construction. It's not something just we agree upon. It's, a, it's something based on natural law or universal law. Uh, for example, when you have, well, I'm from Russia, right? A, an example from wild nature. <laughs> and a pack of wolves, you have this leader guy, right? Alpha. And uh, why is he there? To boss other wolves around? to show how great a wolf he is? Or why is he there in this you know, position? The strongest, the biggest wolf. Somehow he, from birth, he was different. And he was promoted by the force of life to do what? To lead, to protect the pack, to provide the survival, security, and the food and multiplication of the whole pack are wolves, right? So you can say that the nature gives the power to those who benefit the group, not just themsel themselves. So in, in this sense, I want to say that actual leaders are somehow, they feel that they are different. They feel different than the other people. So let me ask you a question. Uh, has anyone felt in life that I am born to make a difference in this world. 
did you feel that I have the power to really make this world better? It just that I have to find the right people, right opportunity, the right resources. But I have that kind of anointment that I'm special to make this world special. Yes or no? But you know, some people never feel like this. <laughs> you felt like this, that's why you're here, but some people never feel like this in their life. Why? Because when, if you feel like this, you feel a calling. You are called to live for the sake of others, to use all the talents, all the experience, and all the resources to benefit the social context that we're part of our nations, or even the world. And so actually it all starts when you really take off your ego and think of others. And this is what volunteerism is all about. But, as I said, it can be a school of true leadership and it can be not. And it depends on which of the four major roads you will take towards volunteerism. I'll try to be brief about this, but this is very important, friends. So, as Michael said, if you don't have resources, what actually can you give to the others, right? So, the biggest wolf actually eats the most, right? He gets the biggest part of the caught animal, right? Why? Is he because he's greedy? Because he has to be the strongest and the fastest. That's why he has to get this this resource for himself. So you can say that there can be four major strategies in any NGO and basically in life. And this will be the axis of receiving resources or gaining resources or simply speaking taking. <coughs> and this will be the axis of giving. So, you know, some people want to receive resources, but they don't want to give out, right? So, what do you call this kind of people? Selfish? <coughs> well, there's a stronger word, starting with the letter P. <laughs> well, this is not in the sense to accuse anyone, it's just like a species, you know? That that in, in nature, somebody just lives off somebody else's blood, you know. <laughs> Let's say, we will do this project if we have the funding. If not, sorry. If my NGO is no longer being supported by the government, sorry. And, you know, there was a survey that, that showed that a lot of NGOs are there doing things only because they have the funding. And the real question is just if your major sponsor stops funding you for any reason, would you stop or would you take action and solve this problem? Well, it, it's great <laughs> that we, we, I think we don't have this, this group of people here. <laughs> There's another one, another category of NGOs and, or volunteers. I call them uh, heroes heroes, those who are giving, those who are sacrificing, those who are go to the extreme, but they themselves look like they need to be helped. <laughs> they don't have resources, and actually they are not trying to have them. They say, we're totally selfless people. We don't need anything. We don't need money. We don't need offices. We, we, we're just totally dedicating ourselves for the sake of the world. And then eventually... They just stand with an empty hand. And leaders actually are the like helping hand that God is lending to the world. And this hand should not be empty. Leaders should be giving something. And if they don't know how to draw resources, how to gain those things that Michael was talking about, so these heroes go and what? Go and die. That means volunteers drop out of the project. That means that they himself lost inspiration. That means that NGO is no longer being funded by whoever was funding it. And that's it. 
Well, there are other people here. Well, they don't give too much and because they don't have resources, that's why their projects always stay as small scale, no impact, just a handful of people with the big names on their name cards. Did you ever meet such volunteers? Well, they can, it can be explained that, well, we don't have the resources, that's where our impact is not that great. But anyway, in terms of the real impact to the world, you could say that these people are outsiders. They're kind of outside of the real world. And so what <coughs> is this conference all about? Creating the leaders and creating organizations that are impacting the world in a true sense. And this is where we are leaders. So leaders should know how to gain resources, how to get the funding, but the basic attitude is that we are here to benefit our nations and the world. So this is about the intent, as Michael was saying, your motivation, your attitude. So as people see you, are you there for funding, for grants, or are you there for genuine service to humanity? What value you are creating? Also, Michael was saying that about skills and talents. For example, we want to save the world, but we don't know how to do it. We don't know how to talk, how to get the fun. We don't know how to make the right letters because it takes actually skill to write a good letter, right? <laughs> that the prime minister should respond to. If, you, if there were a lot of grammar mistakes, <laughs> 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 then, well, every has to be done professionally. Everything has to be done in a very talented excellence way. So excellence is the word that should be used a lot by people who are here because, well, we are not only serving humanity, we're also serving God, right? That's why we cannot do things in a lousy way. It has to be done in an excellent way. So <coughs> when people see us as leaders, how do they find out which is our true intent? How do they figure out what kind of people we are? Do you have any ideas? Well, we, we understand that the relationship between the leader and team is all about trust, whether they trust you, but how? One person told me, uh, we, we had a discussion, that they need to take the risk. <laughs> well, do you agree? Who believes that trust is all about taking the risk? Okay, who believes that trust is about being sure that the other person is not a crook? <laughs> well, let's say, <coughs> actually trust, there are, uh, there, there are again four com components of trust. So you can trust someone if you know their intent, if you know and understand their character, if you are sure of their level of competency, and there is some track record, track, re track record. <coughs> For example, when Michael talks about track record, you trust him, right? After he introduced himself, you feel like he's the person to listen to because a track record means a lot. Well, let's say you're on an airplane and uh, the pilot says, uh, I'm captain so-and-so, I'm happy to welcome you on board our airplane. I'm the first, uh, first time. <laughs> this is my first flight. Do you feel, okay, I'm going to take the risk. <laughs> Um, by the way, I am alone today <laughs> because I hate my teammates and I'm a solo flyer. So, would you feel safe? So, team is important for a leader to be trusted. And then the character. You, uh, people have to be sure that actually your character is not some kind of strange character, right? That, you, that you're a good person, that you're honest. That's what we call integrity. But actually, the simplest thing to actually start contacting people, well, Facebook and Twitter is the way to go.
But besides that, well, imagine if Martin Luther King kept silence. What if Gandhi kept silence? What is the simplest way? Talk. <laughs> Learn to speak well. Learn to present well. And actually, m a lot of volunteers think that just running around making a lot of noise is enough. But to present well, to actually get the message across, is the way how you get your motivation, your attitude out there to the people. And then the, the second character, people can find out about your character if you are with the people, if there is a distance, if your volunteers are here and you live in a, some ivory tower, you know, and you are so detached from reality, how people will understand what kind of personality you are. And competency. <coughs> so this is the first question that we need to address to ourselves. So what kind of skills do I have as a leader? What kind of skills do I need to bring to my team? Michael talked a lot about that, so I won't focus too much on that, but this is very, very important. <coughs> so, <coughs> as volunteers, actually, we are not only serving, but we are also learning. And we are learning to be the leaders. And uh, I just mentioned actually here, from the, in the beginning, the four major kind of things, how people figure out what kind of leader you are. Does anybody remember? <laughs> the first, I said that people will find out what kind of leader you are, right? Uh, first is your vision. And this is, as a leader, we need to communicate our vision to the people. We need to be clear about them, and, and actually, for example, if, if your real motivation is to, uh, well, not to, to give to the world, but actually, as I was saying, that parasite circle, remember? If you start speaking, do you think people will feel that you are not sincere or not? People will feel right away. That's why the first thing that you not only need to speak your message, but you need to, as we say, walk the talk. You need to live what you preach. And this is the second challenge. So the first thing is you actually strengthen your motivation of living for the sake of others. By being active, by speaking publicly about your organization, about your agenda, about your vision. And the second, actually, <coughs> you need to really embody the values that you preach. And this principle, actually, we can call principle of responsibility. I had a talk with one of the, one of the uh, guys on my team recently, and he said that he wants to, to try something else in life. He wants to drop out. I said, so what do you think if I, if I decide the same? If I want to try something else? He said, no, 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 you cannot. I said, why? Because you're a leader. He said, you're a leader, so, le so leaders have no choice. In a sense, they belong to the people that they lead. They belong to the organizations that they create, and they belong to the world. So they really own the organization that they create, but they act, in fact, they are owned by that organization. And this is actually a very serious question, because we can go through rough times in our lives. Sometimes we have the funding, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we are followed by the people, sometimes we are, we are not. But is our conviction strong enough to stay where we are, to keep doing what we're doing? So this actually principle is so important. And actually, this is where most organizations are the weakest. And <coughs> third, as I said, is your strength equals the strength of your team. So that means that when you look for the team, 
And actually, now I'm talking not about just volunteers who come for some time. I'm, I'm really talking about building your in, inner circle of close allies, you know, or you could say your disciples, your uh, followers, people who really stand by you no matter what. And you can find out what kind of leader you are. For example, when you're doing good in business, you're making a lot of money, and you have people with you. But what if you lose the money? What if the, you, somehow you go broke? Will you still have these people w with you or not? This shows the level of commitment of the team to you. So, and so this is the question. Uh, sometimes we are, uh, we, we are too far from our own selves. For example, as leaders, we think about uh, networking, right? About strategic partners. We think about uh, building alliances. We, we're thinking how to work with the government. But as leaders, we need to think how to work with our team, how to inspire our team, and how to bring out the best in my team, and how can I raise them to be really the leaders. So I want to ask you a question. So what do you think is number one objective for any leader? What is his concern about most of all? Well, I can give you a hint. Let's say he's worried about money. He's worried about how to uh, getting more uh, uh, funding, or he's worried about how to get uh, a better track record as an NGO, or he's worried how to get more partners. What is his, his real concern? Performance of the team is good, but there's something more crucial where the sustainability actually is cut. If there is no successor, there is the end of it. The number of leaders that he can raise. And if this work is done by him, then his work is sustainable. If not, nothing will remain. If nothing will be sustainable. So, Number one priority for a leader, to raise leaders in his team and become a leader of leaders. So basically, this is the key point and the key principle of leadership. Develop as many leaders as you can, and this will increase the impact of your organization. Well, I think this is the main thing, the main message that I wanted to share with you today. And uh, this is how actually I was, f I was following these kind of principles, and as Michael said, that mentors are important. So I've learned that from my mentor, actually, Bista Tosaka, the president of GPYC, and these are the principles that are being taught and practiced in GPYC. So for all young people, I encourage you to join this educational track that GPYC is offering, because this is the best way to develop yourself as a leader, and become someone who can raise other young people to become true leaders through sustainable volunteerism. Thank you very much.
question? Um, okay, thank you very much. I'm Naskar from Indonesia. Uh, so that was a really amazing presentation, however. Um, I'd like to highlight some points. Um, the first is the team. Okay, you said that, for example, in order to sustain a team, uh, the volunteer in a team, you have to uh, be able, you have to be smart enough to sustain them. And how are we going to sustain them? I mean, technically, how is it going to be? Because uh, there are so many uh, people who join the volunteerism activity, for example, and one day, because of some technical stuff uh, stops happening in that team, they left the team. Um, we, we don't know exactly how they uh, could leave that, but uh, we know also that because uh, maybe we are still lack of funding, we still lack of uh, uh, endorsement, for example, so they feel that this organization or this voluntarism, uh, voluntarism activity is not really um, uh, what we call powerful to raise up my, myself, for example. They, they think so. So what is your uh, a kind of suggestion or very technical su suggestion in order to sustain the people who work for volunteerism? Thank you. Uh, well, to, to answer briefly, you have to understand the difference between a team and just a group of people. A team shares one common goal. And when you get people in your group, you have to be clear. That's why I said you should learn to speak well. Articulate your vision. It has to be clear. One common goal. Second point that uh, differentiates a team just from a group is uh, a set of clear values. The clear principles that are here, so and they are kind of mandatory for all those who want to be on this project. And the third, and it's very important, that actually uh, you have this, uh, the you should completely prohibit any infighting in your group. So if you have, so this is very important because if you have that strong team, that becomes a magnet that pulls other people. So don't spare time, sit down, write the mission of your team, of your project, make a clear list of the values that are absolutely mandatory for everybody to be in this team. And actually people will kind of feel th if this fits me or, or doesn't. So I think this is the key and actually this is not just my personal opinion, Jack Welsh actually did the same. So he had, um, he should manage by values. So values are for like a ticket to the bus of your team. And the place in this bus is defined by, the by their skills. But if people don't have the values you need, sorry, don't take them on the bus. Now I'm talking about creating the core team. Without this core team, you know, hundreds of volunteers will help, but only for a short period of time. If you want to build a strong team, you need to define clear values. Okay, is that answers your question? Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, because you spoke something about uh, endorsement, uh, in your session, I just want to say that uh, in many projects I have involved in, uh, most of the time we spend raising funds, we spend uh, looking for many partners, for example, but we tend to make our volunteers uh, think that I, we, we, we just spend our time looking for partners and we don't, we don't, get, we don't get something from this. We are just uh, encouraged to speak and to um, persuade people to join with our program and we just uh, we're just working like uh, we're we're forced just like robots we have nothing to uh, to get from this program <coughs> because uh, yeah the most important thing uh, their perception their perception the most important thing uh, for this program is to execute the program smoothly so yeah that is the best that is the best perception they will always think about so how do you um, remove that per per perception actually based on the uh, three points that you have uh, explained before. Thank you.
All right. I think, in my opinion, uh, it works both ways. Uh, number one, don't delete that point. I love it that your volunteers have that perspective where they have to run things smoothly. Imagine, that would be uh, a blessing, a gift to many companies, to many organizations, if their employees or talent have that perspective where I need to make sure, you know, regardless of endorsements that we'll receive, regardless of the support that we'll receive, we just want to get this project done and done it well, run it smoothly. I think that is a gift to many companies these days, especially managing a very energetic and some people say volatile group of talents, the young talents these days. So don't take that perspective away, all right? You should be grateful that your volunteers have that in mind. That means they are amped, they are driven, they are focused to create something good for your organization at the end of the day. But now your question was, of course, um, how do you position your mindset to perhaps appreciate the power of endorsements, the power of having people recognize what they can do or what they have done. Am I right? Right. Now, I think that boils down back to the leader, where I think being a leader of an organization or a project, we need to give that image. We need to invite our talents into that vision where if this project is endorsed, if this project receives recognition, if this project receives the promotion, the publicity that it so well deserves, then people would be able to contribute more help, more support, and more resources in the things that we do. I think oftentimes volunteers do not take, do not take endorsements as a priority it's because it has not been communicated to them clearly. And what I mean by being communicated to them clearly is simply sharing with them. Why do we need to leverage? Why do we need to build connections? Why do we need to build a list of brands, a list of credible sources, a list of credible people to support what we do? answering the volunteers why, why are we doing it? And the, per the best person to answer the why boils down to the leader leading that project. So if you want to position the mindset of your volunteers, have frequent sessions with them. I'm gonna share two very short examples that I've personally gone through. Number one, in the year 2010, uh, I've had the opportunity to win a youth election here in Malaysia where we represented Malaysia to London to give a speech to 2,000 people and uh, on CNN and appeared on CNN talking about why the social media run by young people should receive notice from government leaders. Now, when I was speaking in that summit, we actually launched a youth report, right, detailing solutions from Malaysian youth that can be shared for the benefit of the world. Now, one of my designers started out as a rookie designer, you know, and she, uh, nobody knew who she was. She volunteered in this project and we designed that book. Now, what happened was I taught her only one tip or one trick. I said, we're going to launch this book. I know it's great. The design is great. The content is super, but we're going to get the prime minister of Malaysia to endorse this project. And she was like your volunteer. She said, why? Why are we asking the prime minister? The last I know, he didn't fund this project. We self-funded it ourselves. But what happened was I told her, I said, can you imagine the day when you're out there looking for a job and we're speaking to a prospective employer and you could open the discussion with the employer saying, I'm a designer. I graduated from a university here. And I've had the great honor to work on a nationwide project that received endorsements from the Prime Minister. What happened? Clear enough, two years later, she did go into the job market from a volunteer. Now she needs to find a job to survive. And she went out there and she used that same tip that I shared with her. She used those same lines. She used those same phrase of opening up curiosity among her prospective employers that she did a project that was endorsed by the Prime Minister. What happened? Number one, our book, that book that we produced, that youth report, was circulated to all government agencies in Malaysia. So each government agency has a copy of that book, at least. This was way back in 2010. 
Unfortunately for my friend, she didn't get a job in Malaysia. Instead, she was headhunted to Singapore and then she was headhunted to the US, to San Francisco. She was earning three to four times the salary of a fresh graduate in Malaysia. She was going global now because she knew what to share. So that's number one. So how did she reach that stage? I shared with her as a leader, I shared with her clarity in why there was an important reason for us to get someone to endorse our project. And secondly, of course, when you get endorsements, always convince your volunteers to distribute the impact of your project to let people know the good work that you have done. You cannot do it alone. Why do you need to waste another 10 years worth of track record to build your popularity so that people will listen to you? Why not get an authoritative figure who has all the influence, who has all the followers, to actually support what you do and instantly convert followers into your new volunteers? I have personally done these projects before myself, which is why I could say it confidently, I can say it passionately, and I can say it with conviction. So please do go back and share with your volunteers these messages that I've just shared with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure you know you have uh, many questions, <laughs> but you know the time is really running short here. So uh, I think you know uh, you can uh, approach them after this session. <laughs> and uh, now I want to introduce uh, Hes Valdez uh, to make his presentation. As you know, uh, Philippines uh, have suffered a lot of uh, you know, uh, situations uh, during this uh, typhoon. So he's here to kind of present his work. And uh, anyway, uh, without <laughs> delay, I, I want to introduce Kes Valdez. Yeah, please welcome him. Yes, uh, hello, good afternoon, everyone. Yes, uh, yeah. Uh, I think I would prefer to talk here, to speak here, in this podium, yeah. <laughs> so I'll just uh, move here, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. But, okay. Yeah, thank you. But before I begin my talk, uh, I would like to invite you all to offer a moment of silence for the survivors of the Super Typhoon, Yola Super Typhoon Yolanda in Central Philippines and also for a global peace icon and Nobel Peace Laureate Nelson Mandela who just passed away yesterday. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's an honor for me to stand before you today to share my story and the principles I learned from my past. First of all, I would like to share with you a quote from a simple street educator who pushes cards in the street to educate, and he was also awarded CNN Hero of the Year 2009. Mr. F. N. Peña Florida has said, and I quote, our planet is filled with heroes, young and old, rich and poor, men, women of different colors, shapes, and sizes. We are one great tapestry. That is a great way to illustrate unity in diversity, isn't it? Am I correct? Yeah, thank you. People of different cultures and religious beliefs tempered and interconnected by a common goal to achieve sustainable peace. Peace that builds bridges instead of walls. Peace that is being lived than just being said. Peace that begins with within. That peace that was once elusive in my childhood. Please watch this video.
name is Kes. I am 13 years old. I live in Cavite City, the Philippines. And this is my story. Sabi ko po ako po ay uh, naninirahan sa kadiliman dahil po ito po yung pagkasunog na po ng buwan. Tapos po yung ginawa mo sakit po pati yung pagbubugbog ko ay yung ano po yung sinasabi niya po na yung pumalas ko po ng isa pangundot na mo. Kaya may isip mo para Kes is only four years old when he has no other choice than to run away from his abusive home. He's all alone. Like many other street children, he tries to survive at the dump site. The conditions are horrible. Day and night he is exposed to danger. He's all alone with no place to call home. At night, he sleeps in one of the open tombs of the local graveyard hoping for a sense of protection. Not a warm, soft bed, but a cold and terrifying place to sleep. But then, his life changes completely. Kes falls in a pile of burning tires at the dump site and is severely wounded. Reaching out for help, there is only one man who cares, Mr. Harley. That day probably was uh, the first day in his life that he felt loved accepted and cared for. Mr. Harnin treats Kez's wounds till they are healed. He takes care of Kez and becomes his guardian. At the age of seven, celebrating his birthday for the very first time, he does something special. Instead of asking for gifts himself, Kez decides to give gifts to the children still living on the street. Thus started his gifts of hope. That birthday of his was the start of something great. From that day, he started giving uh, to a few kids, and then the next year, they added more and more, and the project grew bigger and bigger. He involved uh, some of his friends. It has grown into to something big, and it seems that he doesn't want to stop. Today, Kes has grown to become a beacon of inspiration for many. Dozens of volunteers have joined his organization, championing community children. Flip-flops, toys, toothbrushes, together they have already handed out thousands of gifts of hope. Yet Kes does a lot more for street children. He educates them about personal hygiene, explains them their rights, and takes care of their wounds. But above all, he gives them hope. Everywhere, Kez is being surrounded by children. He gives them love, care, fun and attention. He has already helped over 10,000 street children. He has treated over 3,000 wounds. Whenever he sees someone in need, he lends a helping hand. Kes is undoubtedly a hero because he sees a need and he immediately thinks of a way that he can do something to meet that need. That simple. My motto is, uh, we can change the world one heart at a time. Ang ibig sabihin po nun ay, kung meron po tayong pusong tumulong, kung puso po tayong mag-aruga, uh, pwede po natin mabagi yung mundo po natin yun. So, doon po sa isang tao. To thousands of children, Kez is a great inspiration. He is an inexhaustible source of hope. He is their hero. That is why he is the rightful winner of the International Children's Peace Prize 2012. These young people show the incredible
incredible resilience in the human spirit. And I congratulate this year's winner. Thank you. I grew up in a dump site where nothing's clean. My family picks garbage to sell, garbage to use, and garbage to eat. I used to drink the water from a pothole in the street and even from sewage canals when I was little because I did not know it was harmful to me. Allowing flies to feast on my open wounds and paws was normal to me and my friends. Sleeping inside vacated tombs just to escape beatings from my own parents was the most peaceful I felt then. Today, many children still suffer in the streets, being trafficked, sold, and enslaved. They are close to danger and death. This is why I need you to join me in helping children to better lives by teaching, demonstrating, and spreading love by way of reaching out. And I believe that some of these children you saved today will pay the act forward to help champion their very own communities in the future. I believe that all of us here want to have a much, much better world, right? Am I correct? Yes. We are enjoined with one dream and conviction that is to bring positive change into this world we live in. A friend Peña Florida's mentor Mr. Harnin Manalaisai, who, whom I fondly call Tats, he introduced me to several voluntary activities from distributing biscuits and juices to demonstrating good hygiene practices. I felt good about what I did, especially when people appreciated those small efforts. These experiences made me understand the principles of the power of one. The principle the first principle I've learned is one is never too young to give back to society. Age is not a hindrance for us to make a difference through our own little and simple ways. A small yet significant difference can impact the world we live in. We can prove to the world that no age, gender, and status, and even our bad experiences we limit our capacity to help. One of the principles that that's taught me is when we see a need, do something. My turning point in life is when I got burned severely. The day I suffered the burns on my, on my body was like my baptism of fire. It was so painful that night, at the dump site, the hospital, and also the days that followed. I cried out of pain. On the other hand, that's that was also the day I was rescued. And now, I have tears of joy because since then, up to this day, I know I am loved. Looking back, the fire that burned my skin and flesh is the same fire that started a flame in my soul. A flame that would warm cold hearts. A flame that would shed light to the path of the lost. A flame that will spark hope, lighting an entire sea of darkness and desperation. My dad's Mr. Harnin taught me these principles and keeps on reminding me daily by his own last example. So, when you see a need, stand up. No age requirement to make the first step and take courage. Next, one is never too poor to think of ways to help others. A person may be poor, but he or she is not incapable. At times, we lack resources and, and we feel that we could not do anything. It hinders our desire to help and blocks the opportunity to serve. No, every opportunity to help is like building a bridge of peace towards fellow men. Turning a blind eye on them is like building a wall of distance. 
Our team of C3 initiated in 2010 a project called Ahon Pilipinas or Rise Up Philippines. The project aims to immediately send relief to communities damaged by a disaster like floods, storms, earthquakes, and even war. It is our way of bridging people to live in peace as one great tapestry. But the greatest challenge not only for us but for our entire country is rising up from this recent disaster. Please watch this.
November 8 was the day Yolanda hit, and we wasted no time to respond the next day and sent relief goods immediately to save people. Like us children, you too, you may have your own limitations, weaknesses, and difficulties, but please never use those as reasons or an escape to hold back yourselves when, we, when you see the chance to help and make a difference. Finally, one is never too ordinary to be a hero. I believe that we all want to have a better future and create a solution to the problems we face in this world. I've learned this principle from my personal hero, QF. His efforts for Yolanda victims and survivors made him think of ways to help. Again, please watch this. up and help others, it's always growing. It never stops. In the past several weeks alone, we've seen the devastation of tornadoes touching down here in the United States. We've seen in the Philippines a super typhoon which decimated towns and villages, killing thousands of people. I'll never forget the, the people I met in Tacloban searching for the bodies of their children all alone amidst the rubble and debris without help. Among those responding to the typhoon was Efren Peña Florida we may remember was honored as the CNN Hero of the Year back in 2009 for his work educating kids in the slums of the Philippines. He put his pushcart classrooms to work these last several weeks, encouraging people to donate to the victims of the typhoon, and he helped raise 30 million pesos in a nationwide telethon. Other CNN heroes have also rushed in to help to aid the vulnerable, to help people who have been devastated in the Philippines. 2009 hero Doc Henley they sent thousands of clean water filters. He is here with us tonight. Doc, where are you? Stand up if you would. Doc, stand up right here. Doc is awesome. And, and that's the extraordinary thing about our CNN heroes. Their work never ends. Their work never ceases. And with each passing year, they keep rolling up their sleeves and they keep lending a hand. Take a look. So, Doc, can you uh, tell us about your uh, experience and what brought you here to the Philippines? I mean, like, Efren emailed you. Yeah, it was uh, obviously all over the news, uh, the disaster, and I couldn't believe it at home. And my wife was like, are you going to do anything? Are you going to do anything? And I'm like, I hope so, I hope so. And the very next uh, day, I get an email mm -hmm. from Efren saying, will you come help our people? And I'm like, yes, I'm coming. I'll be there. I'm not really sure what we're going to do just yet, but we're going to be there. And sure enough, we were able to get enough great support from people back home in the States to get thousands of water filters mm -hmm. that we're now bringing in the country, uh, bringing out and distributing all over the uh, region of Tacloban. Uh, later on tomorrow will be north of uh, Cebu and then north of Iloilo from there. And uh, so it's just, I, we wouldn't be able to do our work that we're doing right now if it wasn't for Efren mm -hmm. contacting me and, and helping with all his amazing connections that he has here in the Philippines to get us plugged in where we need to be plugged in so that we can do the work that we love to do. Mm -hmm. Have we been together for like um, since Sunday? So and we've been going around um, later. So uh, what's your assessment? You know, I've been to a lot of bad places around the world. Uh, I was in Syria over this last year, in the middle of the war there. I was in Haiti after the earthquake, and there, it, it's 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 a very sad sight in some of these areas. The amount of destruction, mm -hmm. um, but it, it's everything. It's not just the buildings and 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 the structures. But the trees, everything that was once living is now just blown over. It, it, it was, it's really uh, heartbreaking. But what is encouraging, though, is the people, uh, even though the land is devastated, the people are not devastated. The people are strong, and they're courageous, and they're fighting back, and they're doing whatever they can, not just to survive here, but they're figuring out how to thrive in the midst of all this disaster. So I'm so impressed with the Filipino people and their heart push through this terrible time and make the best of it. Okay, a changed mind and a changed heart can help change this world. So now I stand before you as changed person, from a former street child to an advocate of, po of peace for street kids and as a herald of children's rights. Yes, I am just one, but I have a firm purpose to help make things better for generations to come. One is never too ordinary to do something to help and meet a need. The simple ways of sharing a meal, a toy, a pair of slippers, or a smile will bring joy. And that joy 
will be transformed to hope. Now that the Philippines is filled with grief in this time of great desperation, one can shine in the midst of darkness. I challenge you, fellow peacemakers, light that hope in your hearts today, not only for the Philippines, but for the world. Help us build more bridges in the disaster zone. Be a strong thread in this tapestry of life. We need you. At this point, I would like to pass around these peace and hope buckets, and if you like to donate and support our relief projects, these donations will proceed to the victims of the typhoon. As we pass around the buckets, please remember, let us change this world one heart at a time. Have a healthy life, everyone. Thank you for paying attention. Thank you very much. He's one of the examples who really took from his heart and passion, not only to you know, uh, improve his life, but for the life of others, other children. So I think you know, this is uh, the donations that you can give for those children affected by typhoon to give them the Christmas gift, right, from your heart. So please make your donations. Uh, at the same time, we are kind of running out of the time. Uh, plenary session is starting in 10 minutes. So please <laughs> prepare to go. <laughs> and uh, I really thank you again. And I'm very sorry we didn't have enough time to question and answer. But you know, please catch them. If you have a question, they're ready to answer and available. All right? So thank you very much again for this session. Thank you.